Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Our first reading this morning comes from the 28th chapter of the book of Genesis, beginning with the 10th verse and proceeding through the first half of verse 19. Let us listen for the word of the Lord. Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran. He came to a certain place and stayed there for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place, and he dreamed that there was a ladder set up on the earth, the top of it reaching to heaven. And the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And the Lord stood beside him and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring. And your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth. And you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And all the families of the earth shall be blessed in you and in your offspring. Know that I am with you and I will keep you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob woke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So Jacob rose early in the morning, and he took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up for a pillar and poured oil on the top of it. He called that place Bethel. Our second reading <clears throat> comes from the 13th chapter of the Gospel according to Matthew, beginning with the 24th verse and proceeding through verse 30, then picking up with, uh, at verse 36 and proceeding through verse 43. Again, let us listen for the word of the Lord. He put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore, again, bore grain, then the weeds appeared as well. And the slaves of the householder came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? He answered, An enemy has done this. The slaves said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he replied, No, for in gathering the weeds, you would uproot the wheat along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest, and at harvest time I will tell the reapers, collect the weeds first, and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Then he left the crowds and went into the house, and his disciples approached him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, The one who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world, and the good seed are the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are collected and burned up with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all evildoers, and they will throw them into the furnace of fire where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Let anyone with ears listen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. <clears throat> Open now our hearts and minds, O God, by the power and presence of your Holy Spirit, so that as your word is read and proclaimed this day, we may hear with joy what it is you would have us hear, that hearing we might believe, and that believing we might live lives of richer and fuller service, glorifying you here on earth 
as you are glorified in heaven. Amen. The road to hell is paved with good intentions. So goes the cliché. And perhaps anyone who has ever looked back with regret on something that could have been done or should have been done knows how true those words can be. Oh, we meant to get around to doing what obviously needed doing, but something always managed to get in the way. Oh, well, we say there is always tomorrow, but tomorrow comes and something else hinders us and soon the moment has passed and it is too late. The road to hell is paved with good intentions. I hope that in this moment, when people are calling for much needed reform throughout society, when people are standing up and demanding the promises of equality on which our nation is built, when people continue to suffer under the heavy toll of a pandemic that has killed far too many and left many more wondering how or if they will survive economically, all of our elected leaders will do more than talk a good talk but in the end do nothing to make the difficult decisions needed for everyone's well-being. In times of crisis, our leaders are quick to point out that the people who suffer are in their thoughts and prayers, but without action, those well-intentioned thoughts and prayers leave far too many floundering in a hell of someone else's making or choosing. The road to hell is paved with good intentions. But I don't believe that these words necessarily apply only to those times when we should have taken action and didn't. They can and do apply to those times when we act in ways we think are best, but end up doing more harm than good. And a case in point is our reading from Matthew's Gospel. I think there is a strong temptation among us to dwell on the awful reality of all those weeds sown in what was supposed to be a pure field of wheat. The farmer sowed good seed and then the enemy came behind him and sowed weeds. We are only too glad to think about the weeds, the enemy, the spoiled field and the coming judgment. Of course, more often than not, we lose our patience and we want to start ridding the kingdom of weeds and any number of evils or and any number of evils are perpetrated against others in the name of God. The road to hell is paved with good intentions. We must keep in mind that in this parable, we are not talking about the church's call to confront evil or injustice in the world with the reconciling love of God. In fact, this parable has nothing to do with the world at all. It is a parable about the kingdom of God. It is about religious people, and it is directed toward the likes of you and me. We're told in the story that the slaves make a shocking discovery and ask their master how weeds could exist if he sowed good seed, and the master answers that an enemy is responsible. Then the slaves, motivated by good intentions, no doubt, because who would want to allow weeds to grow and threaten to choke the life out of the wheat, ask their master if he wants them to go and gather up the weeds. And here is where Jesus' parable takes an unexpected turn. We think the answer should be as plain as day. Why let anything jeopardize the welfare of the crop? Of course the weeds should be eliminated. That's just sound farming practice. But that's not what Jesus says. He says that the master tells his slaves not to gather the weeds because in so doing, they might uproot the wheat along with them. The parable then ends with the words, let both of them grow together until the harvest and at harvest time, I will tell the reapers collect the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. I think one crucial detail that is important to understand this parable is that from start to finish, 
the working of the seed that the master sowed is not threatened at all. All things being equal, the seed is in the ground, will do the rest of the job on its own. We learn of no dangers or threats to the seed like birds or rocky ground or thorns, as was the case in the parable of the sower last week. Little wonder that the master is not worried about the weeds choking out the fragile stalks of wheat. He is absolutely confident that what he planted will come to harvest. And deep down, I think we know that too. Nothing in heaven or hell and nothing on earth can stop God's work and God's will. The reign of God is sure and certain. Even when we may have difficulty discerning the signs of the kingdom, the good seeds are alive and well and growing in our midst. So then it is not a danger to the crop but rather the farmer's inconvenience that is the dilemma that is presented in this parable. Still, too many of us have trouble with the response, let both of them grow together. Let it be. Don't do anything. It's a pretty scandalous response when you think about it. But behind that command to let them both grow together is the acknowledgement that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Because in our zeal to root out all evil, we may end up killing the wheat as well. The point is hammered home in the fact that Jesus was not talking about just any weed. Rather, the word he used for weed in this parable was a very specific kind of weed called darnel. It was a rather pernicious weed indeed. It was poisonous, causing blindness and even death if too many of its small black kernels were consumed. Even more troublesome was the fact that it is an annual grass that closely resembles wheat as it grows. In fact, it is related to wheat. They are distant cousins which would explain why they resembled each other so closely. And what Jesus is saying is, despite our best intentions, we don't have to have the ability distinct to distinguish between what is wheat and what is a weed. Hannah Arendt, a sociologist who wrote about the Holocaust, coined the phrase, the banality of evil. And by that, she meant to say that those who are involved with evil are not outwardly grotesque. Evildoers do not run around with pitchforks in their hands or in horns growing out of their heads. For all intents and purposes, in terms of outward appearances, they seem as normal as anyone else. So then, in our righteous indignation, we may think we are called to be divine weed whackers. But the message of the parable is just the opposite, because the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Consider also the story of Jacob. Prior to this encounter with God, we learn that Jacob has manipulated his brother into selling his birthright. He has tricked his father Isaac into giving him the blessing, blessing that Isaac intended for Esau. And if ever someone could have been thought to be a weed, Jacob was such a man. But then comes God's encounter with Jacob as he is literally fleeing from the wrath of Esau. The world of Jacob has changed with this encounter with God. His waking life so far has been driven by guilt and fear, but now he trusts the God whom he encounters in his dream. He would later return home and be reconciled with his brother, and God abided with him the rest of his days. Jacob, the heel grabber, the weed, is shown to be part of the garden of God. And truth be told, if we had our way, more than likely we would have chosen to pluck Jacob from the garden early on. The road to hell 
is paved with good intentions. Robert Capon offers an intriguing interpretation about this parable when he writes, the only troops available to fight the battle are either too confused or too busy to recognize the real difference between good and evil. All they will accomplish by their frantic pulling out of the weeds is the tearing up of the wheat right along with them. Worse yet, since the good and evil in this world commonly inhabit not only the same field, but even the same individual human being, since, that is, there are no unqualified good guys any more than there are any unqualified bad guys, the only result of a truly dedicated campaign to get rid of e evil will be the abolition of everybody. Think about that. In the Presbyterian Church, one third of our book of order is dedicated to church discipline. One third. But the purpose of discipline is not to uproot the weeds. The purpose of discipline is to restore people to a right relationship with one another in the church. If we went around just saying willy-nilly, if you don't do things this way, we're going to kick you out of the church, then what would end up happening? Soon we'd have no one left to kick out. The enemy's whole purpose in sowing weeds, in sowing evil, is because good-intentioned people, or well-intentioned people, will take the initiative and start uprooting everything in their wake, not knowing that they are harming the kingdom of God. That's precisely why in the parable, the enemy goes away after sowing the seed, the weeds. He has no reason whatsoever to hang around. He can't take any positive action to overthrow the kingdom of God. He has no real power to muck up God's will. He simply sprinkles around a generous helping of darkness and waits for the children of light to get flustered and frustrated enough to do the job for him. Goodness itself, in other words, if it is sufficiently committed to plausible, right-handed, strong-armed methods, will in the very name of goodness do all and more than evil ever had in mind. Ultimately, I believe when we get so caught up in focusing on the evil around us, we fail to live up to our calling as disciples. You see, if you are a wheat plant, and I am a wheat plant, then it is not our responsibility to worry about all those things like that we like to spend so much time thinking about. The weeds, the enemy, the spoiled field, the coming judgment. What then are we as wheat plants supposed to be thinking about? The answer is simple. We are to be thinking about bearing the fruit of righteousness. What does that mean in everyday practical terms? It means that we are not to waste our time worrying and fussing about what others are doing, but rather what we are doing. We are not to worry about whether in the end God will send this person to hell or that person to hell, but rather are we bearing the fruits that God has called us to bear? And what does that look like? Well, we might refer to the fifth chapter of Galatians, verses 22 and 23, where Paul writes, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. My point is this. Wheat plants are supposed to bear fruit. That is the great calling of our lives and the purpose of our faith. Now, 
I will grant that may not seem as much fun as worrying about the weediness of others or the actions of the evil one, but it is our calling. God calls us to be who we are, not merely a bunch of individual stalks of wheat in the midst of the world, but a wheat field called the church, living out faithfully and proclaiming daily the mercy and grace of the one who has planted us in the midst of this world as the sons and daughters of the kingdom, as God's people, forgiven and relying on God's promises. And if we are truly devoting our time, talents, and energies to being the people of God who bear fruit, then there will be no time for us to worry about anything else. To God be all the honor, glory, and praise forever. Amen.